Hey everybody, welcome to The Notebook on this Monday, January 8th, 2024. Uh, Arpin, you were at the game uh, against the New York Rangers on Saturday and quite uh, quite a showing from Samuel Montembeau. We were discussing topics that we might, you know, bring up and, and, and you know, discuss uh, for today's episode. And obviously, we could we cannot ignore the sort of performance that Montembeau did, but also uh, the performance that he had, not did, but he had. Uh, but also the fact that more and more, I mean, if you look at the way that he's, you know, he's also played extremely well against Dallas uh, only a few days before, he's really cemented his place as the number one Canadian's goalie. Are you comfortable with... The usage that Martin Saint Louis has done of Montembeau, and is it bound to change from this point on? I thought it was hilarious how uh, I think Marte was asked four questions about this after the game. Yeah, um, and he just he very calmly answered them all. Like I think in the back of his mind, I could see him thinking, like you know what, it's very reasonable for these guys to be asking me this question. <laughs> like it's a very fair thing based on. The last two times we've seen Montembeau play, but really based on his body of work all season. Um, and so, but even though he wasn't going to give the answer that everyone wanted because it's out of his hands and, and, and quite honestly, like it's, I, I, if, if they're going to keep Caden Primo with the club, they can't, they got to play him. They got to play Jake Allen every now and then if he's going to, they can't not play them. I mean, I get it, but And that's, that's kind of what Martin was saying is that, you know, we're managing it and this and that. And I think if it were up to Martin St. Louis solely, he would ride the hell out of Samuel Maltabu. I don't think it's, I don't think it's his call entirely or even at all. Like, I, I honestly think, you know, that guy's trying to make the playoffs and there's no ifs, ands, or buts yeah. about it. Like, that's his goal. The best way for the Canadians to make the playoffs is to, is to ride Samuel Maltabu like a horse because he's playing like one. Um, and so at the end, the best part, the best, the most po politician answer was when our colleague Simon Le Villarange at the end, finally kind of fed up with all the runaround asks him, is Samuel Montembeau your number one goalie? And Marte Saint Louis turns and says, he's playing like a number one goalie. It's like, he didn't answer the question. It was great. Yeah. I loved it. It was, it was great. It was great political theater in that press conference room after the game. But yeah, it's, I think a lot of people are wondering those questions were warranted. Like what us as media members are supposed to reflect what the fan base is thinking or wants to know. That's what we, at least, you know, I think both you and I, and I think most of our colleagues, that's what we try to do when we're asking questions. We're trying to ask the questions that we think fans want answers to. Um, I think a lot of fans want the answer to this question and it's a fair one. Uh, but uh, I think we will start to see more Sam Montabo if he keeps playing like this, it's not that Jake Allen's playing poorly, uh, but he's not winning games and he's not playing. He's definitely not stealing games the way Sam Montembeau is like, he's playing fine. There's nothing bad about it. There's nothing great about it either. It's just kind of there. Um, and Sam Montembeau to quote Martin St. Louis is, is playing like a number one goalie legit. Right. So, What do you do if you're the Canadians? I mean, it's, it's actually, it's an interesting question because management's involved. There's no, there's no secret that they're trying to trade Jake Allen. They'd like to trade Jake Allen. If they get the price that they want for him, it would, it would make all of this a lot easier. And Caden Primo would get more regular reps, even as a backup play once every four games or so would be more than he's playing now. Um, so, I would answer your question as being, yes, I've been comfortable with it up until now. But as of right now, Sam Montembeau has made it quite evident that the status quo can't continue for much longer because he's sort of demanding more, more of the net. And I think when a goalie performs this way to demand more of the net, um, he should get it. It's yeah. just a standard, uh, hockey principle that if you have a goalie who's playing like this and stealing games for you, then you got to play. Well, especially with the fact that Montembeau, uh, I mean, his track record with Montreal is that the more he plays, the better he gets. When he's mm -hmm. busy and he's been playing 
uh, you know, I don't know, five or five of games out of six, for example, he gets into a rhythm and he gets, he becomes more effective. When Jake Allen went down because of injuries in the past two seasons, he would get really into a rhythm and really take the opportunity to showcase himself and say, Hey, I can, I can take the job as a number one goalie. So it's not mm-hmm. the perception of a, another type of goalie who at some point will show that he gets tired. You need some rest and you cannot overplay him. So, and it's interesting. It's interesting because prior to those two stellar games against Dallas and against uh, the Rangers, there, there were two instances where Montembeau, uh gave up, uh, gave up four goals. Uh, he gave up four in mini on 24 shots and four goals in Tampa on 20 shots. But in between that, There was in be- there were 10 games 10 days between those two starts. Mm-hmm. So if he gets busy enough, you might get more of those performances. And now that they've committed to him financially, now they know that they're going to have him, they're going to keep him. Uh well, let's let's see how far you can go with that guy. But the tricky thing on the other end is that Even though everybody knows what's the value and who Jake Allen is, you don't need to showcase him through the league. Everybody knows what Jake Allen is about. Yeah. If you want to salvage a bit of his value, you want to at least send a signal that, hey, he's back on track and he can help you win games, which he has not been able to do so far. No, no. I mean, it's. I also think uh, because – He's a known commodity. I don't think any, no matter how he does, if Jake Allen just starts the next five games and wins them all, is it is it appreciably going to change how the league views him? I mean, it might just because of the the desperation of the current moment to say, okay, he's on a hot streak, or he showed it a capacity to get hot. Maybe he could do that for us. Yeah, at the right time in the playoffs, you know, who knows? I mean, yes, maybe that would, but I mean, really. I don't think Jake Allen's changing anyone's mind on who he is. Everyone knows who he is. Excellent locker room guy. Uh, excellent teammate. Uh, has won before or has been part of a winning culture in St. Louis. Uh, but is a, a very average goaltender. And I don't mean that as a slight. I mean, that's, that's a good thing. You know, mm-hmm. if you're, if you're an average NHL goaltender, then you're in the NHL. You're in, then you're, then you're playing and you're, you're, you're doing your job. You know, and so that's, and with the number of teams who are getting below average NHL goaltending right now, that's, that's a feather in his cap that he can provide average NHL goaltending. And so, um, you know, his wins and losses, I don't think, are, I don't think anyone looks at his wins and losses, especially playing behind the team he's playing behind and says, oh, well, that guy's, that guy's lost it. You know, I mean, it's, if you're the Edmonton Oilers and you say, Well, I think Jake Allen playing behind us would probably have way more wins than he does playing behind Montreal, and they'd be right. Uh, if you're Carolina, if you're Toronto, if, if you're any number of teams, L.A., I mean, uh, you know, th- this is – and not, and, and the other great thing about him is that he's he is kind of an ideal tandem goalie, and you know that he's not going to be upset no matter how you use him. You yeah. know, as long as the team is going well, like he's he's – He's good for it. And, and we saw it last year, like when Montembeau started getting more starts, like who was his biggest cheerleader? And did you see Jake Allen's reaction last night after the game? Like when he went to go see Sam Montembeau, like there was perhaps no one happier for Sam Montembeau yeah. last night than Jake Allen after the game. Yeah. And it's at every opportunity has just pumped that guy's tires because, because of just the level of respect that he has for how Sam Montembeau has really kind of grabbed the reins of his career in Montreal and, and made himself a better goalie through hard work and dedication. And, and the whole room feels that way about the guy. For sure. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know to what extent playing Jake Allen and having him win some games would really appreciably change his trade value. I don't, it, it wouldn't hurt. But what would hurt is if he goes out and starts playing awful. <laughs> that would really well, hurt. Well, that's it. It, it seems like so, uh, only a, a lose-lose proposition, you know? If he plays well, it doesn't change anything. If he loses, then right. then it, it, it hurts his value because teams will start saying, well, we have 
our guy that we're looking to improve on can do mm -hmm. pretty much the same as he's doing as that guy is doing. And Allen with his contract, well, is it is it worth spending assets on or is spending cap space on? Yeah, it's it's very similar to the debate uh, that that goes on when uh, when you have a junior eligible player, whether you send them to the World Juniors or not. And it's again kind of a lose lose if you dominate. Well, you're supposed to dominate. Like look at Matt Poitra. Uh, Matt Poitra, I should say. It's uh, he was uh, you know he had a so so tournament. Mm. Comes off as a big disappointment because he's an NHL guy, and even though he wasn't like a high draft pick and didn't have pedigree the pedigree he had was being an nhl player on a, on a really good nhl team you go to the world juniors you're expected to dominate you don't it comes back it's it's a disappointment you know and yeah. so it's uh it's sort of the same dynamic there in terms of jake allen. but i think you know i, I don't think the canadians are going to park jake allen I, I really don't but it's getting really difficult to not start sam Montembeau on a more regular basis and and the, the trade deadline's still you know two months away so jake allen's going to get his starts but I mean, I don't see how you can justify it to the guys in that. Like, forget the goalies. The other players on the team are going to start to look at their coach sideways if Sam Montembeau doesn't start getting the lion's share of the starts. And that's what I think is is of utmost importance is that, you know, the, the, the players on this team uh, deserve the best opportunity to win every game. And that's yeah. clearly, clearly Sam Montembeau provides that. Yeah, well, every time that a coach makes a decision on a, a roster decision and he justifies it in front of the press, he'll say, well, that guy, we consider that he's giving us the best chance to win. Well, when it comes to who's your goalie, uh, if you go strictly by that metric, it shouldn't be a problem. It's only when you start saying, well, it's his turn or we've got three guys, both need to be to, to see some action and they cannot stay idle for too long and the You know, those are factors when you got three goalies. So, um, but they're legitimate it, factors. Like that's the problem yeah. is that they're not, they're not, they're they're real. And ultimately, the team gets hurt. Like if Jake Allen or even well, Caden Primo, Caden Primo's been sitting for a while now. Um, he can't sit too long. He's got to stay sharp. Like it's it's. It's just the reality of being a goalie. If, you, if you're sitting for too long, and that's what I think really predicates who plays and who doesn't, aside from who gives them the best chance of winning, is how long has that guy been sitting around? Right. And I don't think the Canadians want at least not the top two guys to go more than a week without playing. Like that seems to be sort of the limit that they've they've used. Um, I think Sam Sam has gone a week without playing at, at, at a couple of times, a couple of points this season. Jake's done it as well. I mean, Primo's definitely done it, but um, I think for Primo, it's probably two weeks. It's the limit, but it's it really does seem to be the biggest concern in, in the goalie usage is how long has he been sitting and not playing, and that's right. that's what sort of judges it. And you know, it does seem to be a collaborative decision, which is why Marty, when he has to sit on the firing line and answer all these questions and he looked kind of exasperated because it's like, it's not only my decision guys. Like, I feel like that's what he wanted to say. Right. It's not only, it's not only up to me. So side note here, you mentioned the, uh, the LA Kings in passing their backup mm -hmm. goalie. Phoenix Copley is officially out for the rest of the season. Yeah. Torn ACL. Uh, exactly. So you'll have surgery on that. So for now he's on LTIR. Um, But he's a UFA at the end of the year, so either the Kings decide to keep David Rittick as their backup goalie to Cam Talbot. Um, all three Big of their Dave. goalies, all three of their goalies are, are UFAs after the season. So either it's Rittick as a, as a backup goalie, or they go outside for some help. So yeah, be interesting. So that's I mean, they just throw their name on the pile. You know, I mean, it's uh, that's what I you know, and and. At some point, Ken Hughes' price is going to have to come down, I would imagine. I mean, if it doesn't, then power to him. And based on his history, his brief history as general manager, he generally doesn't bring his price down. You mm -hmm. know, he got, like, based on what he got uh, in situations where you didn't think he was going to get a whole lot, um, I think his – Price might never come down. And if it means not trading Jake Allen, then so be it. 
Because yeah, but it, he's going to be just keeping the same problem until next year. At some point, this situation. Oh, you can deal with it in the off season. I mean, yeah, you could. I mean, if it if I don't think you would it would bleed over into next year. I mean, I think there would be a way to find Jake Allen a home at the draft if it ever came to it. And I'm not saying he's not going to trade him. What I'm saying is that I think what based on what we've seen of Ken Hughes is that he's a stick to his guns kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Is what I is what I mean by that, and if you know, I, I don't know to what extent he's gotten firm offers on Jake Allen. I think it's just been a lot of discussion more so than actual, because because I, I think those discussions they're so far apart. Whatever he's talking about with whatever team he's talking about, I feel like what Ken Hughes wants and what they're willing to offer is not even in the same galaxy, and so it doesn't even get to the point where an offer would be made. Because they're not speaking the same language. So yeah. let's see what happens. But a funny little side note on Sam Montembeau. Um, so last night, Brandon Gallagher was talking about Sam Montembeau. And he said, man, I remember his first game. And I've heard Nick Suzuki say that. I've heard a number of guys mention how they remember his first game. So for the record, his first game was a 5-1 loss to the Buffalo Sabres. It was on October in October of 2021. October... I have the date here. Yeah, it was October of 2021. First and impressions, so, huh? First impressions. Yeah. <laughs> First impressions, yeah. And so after the game, um, I went to ask him what his memory of that game was. And it turns out that our colleague Eric Engels had just asked him that question. So I was like, okay, you know what? You don't have to answer that question. That's fine. I came in late. He's like, but you know what I can do? He looked at me. He's like, you know what I can do? I can tell you exactly how each one of those goals went in. I was like, oh, really? Well, please do. And so then, he starts, <laughs> so then he starts describing them. And he's like, well, the first one was a long shot from the point. Second one, flash screen, Kyle Poso, low blocker. Uh, the third one was from the top of the circle, this, that. He couldn't remember the fourth one. Uh, he remembered that he gave up two goals in the first period. One of them was on a five-on-three, perhaps. Then, he, then he, it did, he played poorly in the second. So I actually went and checked. And... You know, like Steven Stamkos is like this. Like you could talk to Steven Stamkos about a game. Like you could go up to Steven Stamkos and say, hey, remember when you played uh, the Stars? Uh, it was like in December of 2019 and you uh, you scored in the second period. Like, do you remember that? And he will tell you exactly how he scored that goal. Like that's – there's some yeah. there's some hockey players who are just like that. And so Sam Multubo did this. So I did – I checked after, and sure enough, he got the order wrong. The, the Ocposo goal, flash uh, flash screen, low blocker was the first goal, not the second goal. Zemgis Gergensen's was the long point shot uh, that, that hit someone in front. He actually remembered that Ben Sherratt tried – no, which one was that? There was, there was a goal that he remembered that Ben Sherratt tried to block, and it bounced right to a Sabres player, and they scored. Well, that goal happened for real, the way he remembered it. It's just, it was pretty impressive. And he's like, I can do that for a lot of games. Like it's, it's, so if he turns out to be the Steven Stamkos equivalent as a goaltender, the Canadians have themselves a pretty good goaltender because that's, that's something that, <laughs> yeah. that's something that Steven Stamkos does. And he, he just whipped it off. Like he didn't, I don't think he knew that we were, anyone was going to come and ask him about that game, but it's amazing to me. Like I don't, particularly remember that game i don't think i covered it i'm not sure no but that's um, his first game with the montreal canadians it would make sense that he would remember it would it. make sense that he would exactly but it you just know. what's funny to me is that the memory of all his teammates is how bad he was <laughs> like yeah. they all remember it as like who the hell is this guy and why is he playing for us instead of Carey Price? Like, this is not what we were expecting. We thought Carey Price was going to be back there. All of a sudden, it's this dude that we just picked up off waivers and just did that. Yeah. So he's gone from that to having a room full of guys who just have the utmost respect for what he's made himself into with that being kind of the starting point of all of their experience with him. So it's... And he's just his – his. if I can share one more thing from last night, because this is a typical scene, and I'm sure you've seen it. Every game or almost every home game, once he's done talking to us or even when he's not playing, there's a crowd of 10 to 12 people 
from his hometown or wherever. I don't know where they're from, but they're f- clearly family, friends. There's a bunch of them. And he goes, he talks to them, he's laughing, he's, you know, he's chatting with them. Mm-hmm. And it just it just shows the importance of playing for the Canadians to this guy. And and it shows, you know, the contract he signed. Why did he sign that contract? Because of how badly he wanted to sign in Montreal and how and how he would do it. It wouldn't stop saying it so. You know, the other day, Brass- the other day in Brassard, I saw him. He was not even in his vehicle, but he had John gone to met outside the building. Had gone to met some some fans there, a group yeah. of what fifteen twenty people. He chats yeah. with people. He's so approachable, and it's he's also a genuinely fact- nice guy too. I mean, it's like he's just genuinely nice, and he and it's he's got the sort of personality where he. You don't feel that pressure gets to him. And it's so rare and so precious mm-hmm. in Montreal that, yeah. especially as a goalie, I mean, it's it's, it's pressure-packed, you know, in terms yeah. of uh, there's not much more pressure than being the, the Canadian's goaltender in the NHL. Uh, and he's he's doing good, quite well. And sorry, were you done, though, with that? With that, that uh, well, yeah, no, that no. And, I, and, yeah, so and I agree with – I was done. No, I was done because that's. I think that's part of it. Like the pressure yeah. – The part, like the dealing with the pressure, like that's, that's what I meant. Like it's that it's not just his own pressure. It's not just his teammates. It's his family. It's his friends. He knows he, he's, he knows what the Canadians are all about. He knows what being the starting goalie, the Canadians means. And he, and he just goes with it. But the, what's precious, what's even more precious is that you have that side of his personality and you also have that side that we saw against the Rangers in that shootout and how fired up he was that they won that game. He's a competitive guy. He wants to win. He wants to succeed. So you have that fiery competitiveness coupled with the low key laid back uh, personality, approachable uh, and, and appreciative of his place on this team and, and, and this team's place in Quebec society at large. You combine all that together And you, it's a pretty special package. And so as long as he can keep performing in net the way he has, and, and really over the last two seasons, he's shown no, he's given no reason to think that you should expect otherwise. Um, that combined, the performance combined with everything else is just, he's the perfect goaltender for the Montreal Canadiens. Like there's, it might sound like hyperbole, but it's really true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... At the same time, is he for a rebuilding team? Is he is he is he playing too well? Huh. In the sense that because because you look at the for example, you look at the uh, the stats of uh, the, some stats are, that are generated by a Hockey Reference. Uh, uh-huh. The quality starts percentage this season. Uh, when you look at the different Montreal Canadiens goalies, uh, Montembeau has a. 706 quality save percentage uh, quality start percentage yeah so roughly so 70 both primo and allen are way back at 500 so mm-hmm. it's so he's, he's he's been giving you 20 more quality starts uh and i wonder because i know that it's it's a talking point when it comes to montambo he says oh, it's great that he's you know he's That he's proving that he belongs and that he's he's fighting for uh, fighting for his career for his job and he's helping his team. He's doing what he's paid for. But at the same time, I've seen some comments out there saying, "Well, the fact that he was just that good, well, it it, it prevented the Canadians from getting an even higher pick last season, and it could very well be the same this season." Mm-hmm. I don't know if in terms of priorities. I know that's not how the Montreal Canadiens uh, think because they want they want to be able to trust some guys and want to count on some guys and have some building blocks. They don't want to always bring it all back to are we drafting high or not. But they, I feel that there's a bit of it's not resentment, but there's a bit of a bittersweet taste when it comes to Montembeau from certain mm-hmm. fans uh, because of the fact that his play. He's been able, as you said, he's been able to steal games. It goes back to last year, and that has made a difference in their overall record, for better or for worse. Yeah, uh, I'll try to find it. 
I don't know who asked the question, but it is, it is mailbag Monday today. And so, um, and I don't, I'm not jumping the gun and going straight to the mailbag, but we did have a reader who, who wrote a question about that. And I thought it was actually a very good point. Sorry. I can't, can't find it right now, but um, basically said this line of thinking that Montembeau was playing too well for a rebuilding team. Oh, I have, you it. have it. I have it. I have it. Kyle, Kyle Lambert. Lambert. Yes. Kyle Lambert. So, so that's it. Yeah. Where, well, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I, well, ask the question. No, okay, no, no. Ahead. I don't have it in front yeah. of me. Okay. So, where do you land in the debate over whether the goalies, snacks, really, mm -hmm. Montembeau, are ruining? Ruining the rebuild. While I sympathize, I also see Buffalo, Ottawa, New Jersey, Detroit, sort of, Edmonton, etc., desperate for decent net play. Doesn't it help if the Habs have a potential start? There you go. So that's Kyle's Thanks, Kyle. Question. I think the question answers itself. I mean, it's really, yes, perhaps it'll cost them a few ranks in the draft. Um, but if the Canadians have really found something here at the very worst, you know, I think we all kind of assumed when Jake Allen signed his extension, that he was the bridge to whoever the next goalie of the Canadians will be at worst. Sam Montavo has become that bridge at best. He is that goalie. Mm -hmm. um, but at worst, if it is Jacob Fowler or another goalie, um, Sam Maltabo can get the Canadians to that goalie, but he has the potential now. I think the body of work is large enough now that he could potentially be that goalie himself. And so if you found that goalie, yeah. you know, it wasn't very long ago. <laughs> this is what's funny about this is that how many times have we been asked, what are the Canadians going to do about their goalie? When are they going to get a goalie? How are they going to get a goal? How are they going to find a goalie? They're going to need a goalie when they're good. Well, Lo and behold, they have potentially found a goalie. And so I think you should embrace that. You know, it's not – and I. but what I do understand is that there's a certain level of, I think, PTSD from, from the number of times Carey Price prevented the Canadians from properly rebuilding because he single-handedly yeah. got them into the 20s in the drafts year after year and resulted in – uh david fisher and ryan paling and and all these michael mccarran and all these sort of underwhelming first round draft picks he was not there david no fisher. he was not there he had david not fisher, arrived right. mccarran paling um i can't think of there's got to be one more in there but anyhow he did he did get them further back in the first round almost alone many times um mm. i don't know if sam montambo has the potential to be that impactful but he might cost them he might cost them a well, couple even, of a couple of slots and so be it i mean even even if he's a third tier number one goalie even if he's between the 20th and the 30th best goalie in the league yeah as long as he's as long as the canadians have one of the top 32 goalies that's what you want you want your number one goalie to be a number yeah. one goalie and And that's where right now he yeah. places himself. Is he going to be a top 15 goalie? No. Probably not. I mean, right now. He's, he's certainly not going to be I as mean, listen, as Carey Price. Even after the last game, he's he's 22nd on evolving hockey in terms of goals saved above expected. On Money Puck, in terms of goals saved above expected per 60, among minimum 10 games played. So high filter I put on here. He's 34th. But he's mm. also one behind Andre Vasilevsky, and he's one ahead of uh, Georgiev in, in Colorado. So it's not as if he's in bad company, but Jake Allen is 39th, five spots back. So it's not really – right. Um, he's, he's not an elite goalie. I mean, let's be honest here. I mean, he plays like an elite goalie sometimes, but what, what Martin said about him is accurate. He's playing like a number one goalie, and what you just said is accurate, and that's, that's the bar. You want your number one goalie to play like a number one goalie, and that's what he's doing. Yeah. In front of him, the defenseman. There's a lot of things that's been that have been said. Often the same statistic that was mm -hmm. brought up that the Montreal Canadiens group of defensemen were scoring 
a surprising number of goals. And they're always, no matter the day of the week, they're always top three in the league for the number of goals scored by defensemen. They seem to be in a race with the Colorado Avalanche on that, uh, mm -hmm. that statistic. Uh, and obviously, these spontaneous ideas that, oh, look at that, they're contributing offensively for a team that's so starving of offense – It's a good thing that the defensemen chip in and provide their amount of offense by scoring some goals. Uh, but if you look a bit further and you look at the number of assists that those defensemen provide the team, then it, it's not so good. So I wonder, and it's a, I wonder, it's a rhetorical question, but that's my way of presenting it to you. If it's, it's hiding Another issue, the fact that we're talking about the goal scored by defensemen, uh, it's, it's, it's hiding a potential problem for them, uh, whereas the, their low number of assists could suggest that they're not generating a lot of offense because what you expect from defensemen is that they will be effective in transition. They're going to bring the play to the other end. Not necessarily that they're going to be the guys that are going to occasionally jump into play and present themselves as uh, shooting options, you know, when you got a Suzuki looking for an option in the offensive zone or anybody else, and then all of a sudden, ta-da, here's Justin Barron showing up, and he's there, uh, you know, un unchecked, and uh, he scores a backdoor goal or whatever. That's great. But in terms of sustainable offense provided by the defenseman, the picture is not all that rosy. No, I mean, listen, before... You know, I mean, yes, they're second in the league in goal scored by a defenseman to Colorado, who's at 32, Montreal's at 30. Um, and everyone always says, oh, well, Colorado has Kale McCarr, and how, how is Montreal keeping up with them? Well, the Colorado Avalanche defensemen have 88 assists. They have 120 points. They lead the league in points by defensemen and goals by defensemen. They're second to the Canucks, who have Quinn Hughes, obviously, and then Philip Ronick. Um, in assists, the Canadians have 49 assists from their defensemen, 30 goals, 49 assists, 49 assists from defensemen is 30th in the NHL ahead of only Arizona yeah. and San Jose. Uh, in terms of points, they are well back as well. 79 points. They're 19th up the number that's obviously propped up by these 30 goals. So yes, I think. You know, when, when did we talk about OGP, offense generating plays with Nick Suzuki? Um, I don't know what the Canadians def – it was, it was a, little, a few weeks ago. Um, yeah. So for those who didn't miss that, who missed that episode, OGP is basically a series of like eight offensive actions that the Canadians and, and actually that, that get tracked around the league by sort of third-party uh, stat suppliers. And um, they're all – plays that you assume will lead to offense. And most of them are predicated on getting pucks in some way, shape or form to the slot area. Um, and how Nick Suzuki was trending up in that. If you take that same principle to the Canadians defenseman, yes, they're getting goals, which is a result stat. Um, but the process stats, I don't think are all that great. And I don't have them in front of me. I don't have access to them. They're probably like, I don't, you know, I happen to get, Suzuki's because I was talking to him about it, but but you look at not only these numbers, the 49 assists, but just the way the Canadians generate offense. Like it's pretty rare that the Canadians to see other than Mike Matheson, to see a Canadian's defenseman skate the puck up the ice, make a pass, and have that lead directly to a scoring chance. And that's yeah. what that number I think reflects. And so overall From a big picture standpoint, and it's not as if the Canadian's defense is 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 a finished product. It's far from it. It's it's going to change drastically over the next few years, and it's going to be infused with a lot of talent. Uh, you know, Lane Hudson will naturally help this. Uh, even you know, to hear JF will talk about him, Arbor Jackye will help this. You know, I mean, there's Caden Gooley when he's at full maturity, he's struggling a bit right now, but when he's at full maturity should help this. Uh, but right now the Canadians defense is not actually generating offense. They are 
they are they are producing offense in the sense that they are finishing plays rather than creating plays. And I think you would want a defense core to be to be to be making offense generating plays as opposed to the the final play in 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 an offensive situation. Well, in an ideal world, you would have both from them. Yeah, <laughs> but because it's, it's good that they're it. It's good that they're they're jumping in the play and and they you know they they present themselves as options and mm. I, I like that. But in terms just of what's sustainable, I mean, you got three defensemen on their roster: Baron Kovacevic and Gustav Lindstrom, who have more goals than yeah. assists. That's that's a rare occurrence when it comes to a decor. Yeah, well, so. it's, and that's and and in the case of Baron, um, I think that's that's the best reflection of of how it's somewhat concerning. Like you look at Baron, the way he plays, you you would think he would be at the origin of more offensive plays than he is. Um, assists aren't the end all be all of of that. Uh, it's it's very possible for a defenseman or any player really to, to be, I think Slavkowski for the last little while has shown that you can, you can lead to offense being created without getting an assist many times it happens. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, Justin Barron is, it's a part of his game that I would like to see some growth in, like just his ability to, to, to make plays that lead directly to offense and, and not, him scoring necessarily, but him, his vision, his skating, his passing ability directly leading to the team's forwards uh, scoring more goals. Because the other thing the Canadians lead the league in is 28% of their goals have been scored by defensemen. Second, Colorado, 21.8%. So there's a 6% gap. And nowhere else, I mean, it's that gap is, that's the biggest gap between two teams in the league. It's, 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 they're getting too many of their goals from defensemen. Not just, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's fine that they're scoring goals and they have to this point. Well, it says something about their, it says something about their group of forwards. I think it also says something about the group of defensemen. I think the forwards, yeah. the fact the forwards aren't scoring has something to do with the whole offensive process. You know, the offensive process starts in the defensive end and it starts with your defensemen getting the puck into their forwards hands with speed, you know, on mm -hmm. in stride and able to head towards the offensive zone in an attacking way that keeps their opponents on their heels and has them scrambling and, and make you more difficult to defend and leads to goals. And I don't think the Canes, the Canes defense isn't doing that. And maybe they just don't have the defense to do it right now. And I, I think that's a fair, that would be a fair point to make. Like Mets is really the only guy who can do that. But this whole notion that the yeah. Canadians have this great offensive defense core, just because they scored a lot of goals, I think is a bit of a misnomer. And I think it's reflected a bit in their point totals. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Justin Barron because I think the, the main reason why the Canadians management and coaching staff invest so much mm -hmm. in him is that they see him as a as a prime passer yeah. as as p potentially the best passer that they've gotten on their team at least on the back end so those goals are great he's done it i mean it's, it's that sort of initiative he's he's done it mm -hmm. since juniors and and he's a mobile guy also you know he, he's generally very comfortable walking the blue line on on the power play and things like that but his main dimension at the nhl level is probably his passing. So how do you go from using that strength of yours and translate it into points, or at least translating it into su sufficient scoring chances? I'm not sure I see that I from Baron. And it might explain why, at some point, if the points don't come, the risk in his defensive game, if it remains the same or it doesn't decrease, well, you don't get as much of the benefit of playing him all that much. And, you know, we brought up the other day the fact that Struble, Struble's minutes uh -huh. have gone up. 
Well, all of a sudden, in the last six games, it's it's Barron whose time on ice is decreasing, and he's a right-handed shot. He should be a top four defenseman in this situation that he's in, but slowly but surely, he's losing some of that time on ice because he's not the greatest defender, and offensively, that passing ability is not translating into a lot yeah. of scoring. Chances. No, hundred percent, and that's uh, uh, it's, we're seeing it. And it's only getting more and more pronounced. I mean, last night, I'm no, sorry, not last night, Saturday night, um, Struble passed Gooley for ice time since Christmas. So in those six games since Christmas, Jaden Struble has the third most ice time among defensemen on the Canadians ahead of Gooley. Yeah. So, and, and again, that's, so that's, you know, that goes to a meritocracy, uh, which, And good on Struble. I mean, honestly, it was great talking to him after the game, him talking about how he still comes in every game and stares at the board and waits for them to put the lineup on because he's not sure he's going to be in the lineup. I love that. I love that. That's great. He's just like, I still treat it like the yeah. second game. Where, and I look at that board and I hope my number is there. And when it is, then I get ready to go. You know, and I was like, that's I hope that never changes. I hope if he plays another 15 years in the NHL, I hope he keeps doing that every night. <laughs> and, and just and like, <laughs> it's a great attitude to have. It's a great yes, attitude to course. have. And he's, and, and the beauty of it For is sure. that some guys would have that attitude and they would go into the game and say, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure I'm in. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go score a goal. Or I'm going to go make a big hit. I'm really going to put my stamp on this game. Jaden Struble goes out and says, I'm going to make sure I'm in the next game, but he does it by being calm, poised, making good decisions, not making mistakes. Like that's his, the way he makes sure he gets into the next game is the right way to do it for a young defenseman and not the yeah. opposite and not what I think a little bit of what Jack I was trying to do earlier this season that got him in trouble and ultimately wound up sending him to Laval was was trying to do too much and Jaden Struble doesn't do that. So it's very efficient. extremely efficient. That's the thing. And it's, it's and he's and I think the Canadians deserve a lot of credit for slowly but surely giving him more. Say, okay, you're good with 12. Mm -hmm. Let's see what you could do with 14. Okay, you're good at 14. Let's see what you could do with 16. Okay, you're good at 16. Let's see what you get. Last night he crossed 20 for the first time in his NHL career. He was his first 20-minute 20, 20 yeah. game, largely because he was on the ice in overtime for like two minutes, but still, first 20-minute game on Saturday that's night. That's meaningful. If you're there, if you're there in overtime against the New York Rangers, it means something. The level of trust well, I mean, that's, has I mean, really gone up. A minute into his shift in overtime, the Rangers sent Panarin over the boards, and all of a sudden Panarin has the puck on the right side in the Canadian zone, one-on-one, -on -one, Jaden Struble. Turns out that Jaden Struble had lost an outside edge earlier in the shift. And yeah. uh, so he's like, he was laughing about it after the game. And he's like, well, so I lost my outside edge. So I couldn't, I didn't want to lean on my outside edge too much or else I would have fallen. So my, basically my whole thought process was don't fall, try and lock this guy down as soon as, soon as possible and get off the ice as fast as humanly possible, because this is not a sustainable situation. It's, and he did that. Panarin didn't score. Um, it's not as if Struble made some spectacular defensive play. He just stayed in front of him, and I think Panarin's pass hit him in the leg or something, and I can't, really, can't exactly remember, but he neutralized the play in an unspectacular way, and he got off the ice. He accomplished exactly what he set out to do. And so... Um, yeah, he asked, uh, he asked Suzuki to hold on to the puck in the back so of the net, off, so he, yeah. you know... Good so, get off, yeah. let's, get into our, let's get into our mailbags. Um, We've got a lot of questions, and we have a big one. Yes. We have a big oh, wow. one to start. Now, now, we, you guys were sending emails throughout the holidays. Bless you all. And um, there was one that was sent on December 28th from Brian McDougall. So I'm going to read this email because we actually did the research that Brian asked us. He gave us homework over the holidays, and we actually did it. So um, thanks for the great insights, analysis, and all your Habs coverage. You guys really had much pleasure. Much, add much to the pleasure of being a Habs fan. If we can agree the Habs need to acquire at least one more lead goal scoring forward to get to a cup final, what are their odds of doing it by one, developing existing prospects slash drafting new talent, two, trading for it, or three, buying it through free agency? 
here's the here's the homework part. If we look at the top three scoring forwards for each team in the Stanley Cup Finals during the past decade, so six players per series, 60 in total, how many of them were acquired by their respective teams via each of the three possible channels, draft, trade, purchase? Among the top 60 offensive snipers, how many were not first-round selections? How were those players acquired by their respective cup contending teams? What does this kind of research suggest to us about how Hugo should proceed during the next two to three years? Uh, Brian McDougall. So, Brian. Um, Thanks for not asking yeah, GPT. And exactly. Asking so, so we went ahead and did that. Uh, looked at the last 10 years. Um, there's a couple of disclaimers. First of all, we looked at um, – the Stanley Cup finalists top three playoff scores. Uh, Brian didn't really specify whether he meant playoffs or regular season. We felt um, what's relevant here is how do these teams reach the Stanley Cup final? And so we took the playoff scoring. It shouldn't be too different from regular season, but I think there were some cases where it was. But in any case, um, for the purpose of, of this study that was commissioned by Brian McDougall, um, it, it, still, it still fits. So, and the other caveat is that when he says six players, 60 total, obviously you have teams that were in the finals more yeah. often than not. Uh, teams like uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning, so the same names tend to come back. So if it, it, a player, let's say a guy like Kucherov, was drafted mm-hmm. in the second round, well, his name appears four, four times. Four exactly. times. But it's offset by Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin appearing four times, or even six times, if I'm not mistaken. So... Um, so yeah, so there, and the other caveat being that the, the Vegas Golden Knights reaching the final with a team entirely acquired or almost entirely acquired uh, through the expansion draft um, makes for a very separate category of player. Um, but basically, we're looking at 60 players. So of those 60 players, um, 36 of those top three scorers um, on each Stanley Cup finalist, uh, 36 were drafted. Um 13 of those 36 were top five picks. Eight were later in the first round and 15 were second round or later. Um, again, Kucherov counts for four of those, just as an example, Palat counts for a few of those. It's, 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 but still there are more, there, there yeah, are more second have, round or later. You have Killorn you have there. Killorn, you have Palat. You have Killorn there. You, you got, got Palat, point. you got point. point. You got, uh, and there's a bunch of guys. I mean, it's, it's not only Tampa. That's the thing is that it, it goes on. There's other teams. Yeah. Uh, Arvidsson. Jamie Ben, Arvidsson, Marshan, Bergeron. Um, yeah, Pavelski. Pavelski. It's, it's, there's a bunch. Like, it's not just the Tampa Bay Lightning. Mm-hmm. So Derek Stepan in, to, in 2014. So, um, so 15 second round or later compared to 13 top five picks. So just keep that, just keep that in mind. Um, 13 were 13 of the 60 were acquired by trade. Uh, again, some repeat things. And, and, and it's worth mentioning that the fact that there are repeat guys doesn't really, in my opinion, at least doesn't really cloud the data because they did reach the Stanley cup final that many times. So they deserve credit for being there. You know, like if Kucherov goes four times, and that's just the reality that the four Stanley Cup finalists who had a guy like this in their top three. Um, And we marked 11 as UFA, but that's not entirely true because uh, four of those UFAs are actually expansion draft guys. So the three leading scorers from the first Vegas final in their first season, and Marcia So was one of their top three scorers last season when they won the Stanley Cup. So there's four expansion draft Two undrafted free agents in Matt Zuccarello and uh, what was the other one? It escapes me. Tyler Johnson. Yes. Tyler Johnson. And five traditional unrestricted free agents who were uh, Carter Verhage last season, um, Alexander Radulov, Tyler Toffoli with Montreal. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, Montreal, Montreal went to the finals. The finals. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Pavelski with Dallas. Um, yeah. Is that five? One, two, three, four. No, there was Marion Hossa, Hossa, too. Marion Hossa, Hossa, exactly. Chicago. So, so yeah. by far the least common is, well, the least common is expansion draft picks. But after that, and, the, and undrafted free agents, but the least common 
path to getting these players is definitely unrestricted free agency. There's only five of them. Um, trade 13. The, the, the interesting part to me is the draft 36 drafted average draft position of those 36 players, 45.7. Um, and again, 13 yeah. top five picks compared to 15 that came in the second round or later. What are your thoughts? So, well, I mean, everybody wants a number one overall pick because they think that what's missing on the Canadians is that superstar mm -hmm. up front. But what a story like this tells is that uh, you need to hit at the, the draft no matter your rank, no matter where you draft. The important thing is that you need to find that player. You need to find the occasional Kucherov. It's, people will say, oh, you know, well, that's he's an exception. Yeah, well, how do you explain on that same team, Braden Point in the third round? Ah, is another exception? Well, at some point, if you've got two exceptions making a Stanley Cup winning team, uh, well, let's hope that the 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 the, the draft the the draft uh, the recruiting team led by Barbaroff and Lapointe become the the equivalent of the Tampa Bay Lightning because you cannot just always wait. For a top five pick, you, you need to hit on those later picks. And that's something that really have, has not happened under Trevor Timmons since his, uh, his magical 20, uh, 20, 27, 2007 mm -hmm. draft. I mean, there was, it was really slim pickings. And ultimately, yes, there was the Logan Mayu, uh, draft that, that created all that, uh, controversy. And ultimately led to his demise. But when you look also at the the pros and cons of of you know it, it just his his draft resume, the lack of forwards that were not only drafted higher up, but even in the second, third, fourth, fifth round, there was barely anybody there. There was Lekanen and Brendan yeah. Gallagher, and that was it. So, so at some point you need you need to hit on one of your picks. I don't care where it is. I don't care if it's the top five, if you're drafting 16, if you're drafting 45 and you got a bundle, a bunch of second round picks. I don't care about it. At some point, you need to find and that. So this, this, it's, it's, it's worth mentioning that this, this exercise was only handling forwards. That was Brian's question, was the top three scoring forwards on each team. There are instances here, uh, the Avalanche, their top scorer was Kale McCarr. Uh, when Dallas went to the final, their top two scorers were Haskinen and Klingberg. Um, you know, the taking defensemen. We'll draft sorry, that. Homegrown homegrown guys, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, homegrown high picks as well. But, you know, I mean, it's just yeah. uh, Nashville. I think their top two scorers were Roman Yossi and Ryan Ellis, if I'm not mistaken. So um, there were, there were many instances where defensemen were there, but, and, and this was, but, Forward, the reason why the question centered on forwards, because this is the concern with the Canadians. And like, just going through this list, like, in, so 2013 14, the Kings and the Rangers, not a single top five pick in the top three of either team. Um, the next year, Tampa, top three, not a single top five pick. The year after, the Sharks, top three, forwards, not a single top five pick. The year after, Predators, Top three, not a single top five pick. The year after doesn't really apply because there's Vegas there. But even, I mean, Vegas was Riley Smith, Jonathan Marcheseau, and William Carlson, who were in the years that they were drafted. Or I don't know if Marcheseau was not drafted. If I'm, am, I, am I wrong about that? So no, either it was undrafted or were not top five picks. 2018-19, uh, St. Louis. Um, Ryan O'Reilly was a first round pick, but not a top five pick. But he was acquired by a trade. Jaden Schwartz, Tarasenko were both mid first round picks. So no top five picks, Boston that same year, no top five picks in the top three, Tampa the next year, Dallas the next year. I mean, it just, when you do, when you put this all out there, like from 2018, 19 to 2020, 21, you're talking about six Stanley cup finalists. There's not a single top five pick among these forwards in three straight years. Uh, the year yeah. after, Both teams had at least one top five pick in their top three. And the year after that, which is last year, Sasha Barkov is the only top five pick among the six players. So I don't actually know Jack Eichel is, but he was acquired by trade too. So 
it just, I think going through this exercise was interesting because it just shows that this notion that you have to find these players at the top five, at the top of the draft, uh, doesn't seem to actually be true. It would, it's nice. It's, they're definitely, they're definitely there with, and when you look at the scoring leaders in the regular season, they're all over the place. You see them everywhere. But based on the last 10 Stanley Cup finalists, at least just through this exercise, doesn't seem to be a prerequisite to reaching that stage of the playoffs. Yeah, I, I like that. It, but I think that there, there's also, what was, I think it's nothing earth shattering that, um, that. Yeah, when? was he a top five pick? That was, uh, uh, it was either five, six or close, I feel like he was there. six. Sixth overall. Yeah. So, yeah. So last year you had Barkov, and if you want to push it to top six, it would be Kachuk too. Even though he, but he was acquired by trade. He wasn't yeah. obviously wasn't drafted by the Panthers. So that's right. So yeah, but I think that for, anyway, in the if you put that in the situation of the Montreal Canadiens, it's extremely unlikely that they're going to be able to find a UFA that would fit that mold. Yeah. And I don't think that they have already drafted a kid that is bound to become a surefire top six or even top mm -hmm. liner. I mean, maybe maybe that Joshua Wall will surprise us and be that guy. Maybe he's a second rounder in the waiting, uh, second liner, sorry, in the waiting, possibly. Meshar? Uh, I think that they're, I yeah. think, or Meshar. Yeah. So those are, so either it's, either it's those two kids, either it's a an upcoming draft pick, But I think that a trade is probably, in the case of the Montreal Canadiens, the way that they're currently built, is potentially the 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 mo the 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 better option of where they have the the best options because they can choose at some point if they think they've identified a specific mm -hmm. need, they can choose to overpay to get that guy. Um, whereas I don't think that there's there's there will be hardly anybody on the UFA market yeah. that would fit the bill. Especially since those guys, they're older, and the team, the Canadians will be looking to add, if they want to make a sustainable winner of the, out of that group, they'll be looking for a player that's slightly younger and that can, that be, get, that can mm -hmm. be coherent with the group that they already have. So, but, I mean, it's no, so, I don't think that it's, it will surprise anybody to hear us say that, You know, the the draft is mainly the main builder of a Stanley Cup champion. It's just not always the top top three, top five picks. Yeah, it's yeah. And it's and it's not always forwards. I mean that's the thing, is there's there's a number of these teams that made it on the strength of a, a strong defense. I think the Rangers in 2014, Ryan McDonough was was I think their top scorer that that year. Um, you know, Duncan Keith with Chicago, Chris Letang with the Penguins. Brent Burns with the Sharks. It just, you know, it goes, and really the Predators are the most striking example of the team that really rode a strong defense to a Stanley Cup. I mean, it was Yossi, Ellis, Subban. Um, mm. I mean, it's just, that, that was that was the heart of the team, that and Pecorine, right? And so it's, you know, there are different paths. There are different paths and it's not, there's no formula to any of this. And that's what I kind of have, have taken from the last few years is that, You might think that, oh, tear it all down, draft high a whole bunch of times, and then you could build a winning team. I mean, Toronto did that to perfection. To perfection. Like, you couldn't ask for a better scenario than Toronto having, like, three bad years, getting Nylander, Riley, Marner, and Matthews, their entire core, in the span of, like, a few drafts, yeah. And then go right back up and become a competitive team. And they still haven't gotten past the second round of the playoffs. Like, it's just like, it's not, it's not that easy. Like there's a lot of things that go into it. It's not just hitting high in the draft and getting the offensive superstar talent. Yes. It's, I think it's a necessary part of it, but I think it's, it, there's, there's a whole bunch of other ways of going about it. Not to say that the Canes are going about it the right way necessarily. I just think that a lot of the fans or at least a lot of the chatter I hear from in like comment sections or on social media or what have you is this belief that there is this one way of doing it and that's it. And the Canadians haven't done it that way. And so it's wrong. I'm not saying the way they've done it yeah. is right, 
but it's not necessarily wrong either is what I would, would suggest. So. It's also that you're putting it in the past tense and the way they've done it, I would tweak it right. back to present tense. They are doing the way it, they're right. doing it and the way that they will do it because it's, it's very much an <laughs> ongoing yeah, process. Yeah. You're, you're correct. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's a better way of putting it for sure. Uh, okay. Next, next question. Uh, So that was that was a thought process. Uh, that was yeah. a thought exercise, and you had another thought exercise yes, that the, was brought to this, us regarding dressing yes, a defenseman. So tell us more about going that. Because I have <laughs> thought about this a lot, and so this was um, oh gosh, let me find it. There we are. So this comes from Stuart Wiseman. Thank you for the question, Stuart. It's um, I've thought about this a lot. So. Uh, looking at the young Canadians, defensemen, and prospects, it seems like the following will all eventually play in the NHL. Gouli, Reinbacher, Barron, Harris, Struble, Jackye, Hudson, Engstrom, and Mayu. Add Kovacevic and Matheson to the team's future plans, and the puzzle becomes more complicated with 11 defensemen to slot into six spots. There would be no concern of the Canadi if the Canadians had this positional depth at forward, as they would have enough space to incorporate all of them. So I've been trying to think of a way for the Canadians to use this depth as a strength. It's a unique way to build a team, and this may require an equally unique solution. They recently played a few games with seven defensemen, and in this time frame, the top line was highly productive with the increased ice time. This made me think, has any team ever dressed eight defensemen? By dressing four pairings, the Canadians could hang on to more of their young talent, and I think it would be an advantage for line matching where each pairing could focus on one specific line. Eight defensemen would provide more ice time for the top forwards, And when trying to defend a lead late in the game, the team could play three defense, two forwards. Now, Stewart went to the trouble of seeing if this has been done, and he found one example, Guy Carboneau dressing eight defensemen against the National Predators on December 2nd, 2007, with Matthew Dandino. Was it, it eight was or eight nine? He said it was nine because Guillaume Tendresse is listed as a defenseman, but he's not a defenseman. So it was actually eight. Uh. But he okay. said, you know, Matthew Dandino, okay. Mark Streit were rovers, something he can see Barron and Hudson doing. Um, but he thought dressing that many defensemen oh. would lead to more balanced ice time, except Roman Hammerlick still played 28 minutes. So he says, please let me know how completely insane this idea is. I'd also be very interested if you have a chance to speak with Carbono to ask him for his recollection of that game, which the next time I see Guy Carbono or Marc Antoine will, we definitely sure. will. But I think – yeah. It's a very interesting idea. Like, and the whole 3D 2F thing, this is what really turned my crank because I am 100% on board that when you are protecting a lead late in a game, instead of putting out your three most defensive responsible forwards, put two of them out there, put three defensemen on the ice and play it that way. I just, why would you not have more shot blockers and, and more players who are adept at boxing out and clearing the front of the net and doing all those things I say you put – there's four forwards and one defenseman on the power play for a reason, right? So the opposite should be true, especially in late in the game. It's going to screw up your ice time if you do it like on every penalty kill, let's say, and put like four defensemen out there. You can't really do that. Well, although if you were addressing eight defensemen, you probably could do that. But, um, but at the end of a game, who cares? So – Okay, well, hold on a second. At the end of the game, that's one thing. But you say protecting a lead, putting three defensemen, two forwards out there. I don't know how much ice time you save the, the, your 10 forwards by doing so. But what do we hear about protecting leads that the one thing you don't want to do as a team when you're protecting a lead is oh, no, to I sit mean, back. But I mean you specifically, gain the lead by but playing I mean specifically a certain team. With the other team's goalie pulled. I mean, when you were playing six on five, okay. the way the Canadians were in Dallas, yeah. for instance, yeah. at some point, would it not, would they have not have, they were sitting back anyway. They didn't know what to do. They were shell shocked. Yeah. In that specific situation, which usually only lasts two minutes and not six, you go 3D, 2F. Mm -hmm. Okay. But how much, my, con my main concern with that scenario is that if you regularly play, 10 yeah, forwards? That's, that's what he's, yeah, that's what he's uh, proposed. Right. Well, each of those forwards at some point, they're going to log, uh, they're going to log so many minutes that it, it, it will take a huge toll that over the course of the season, 
I don't see it as very sustainable. You have at least, even if your four line, the fourth line plays eight or nine minutes a night, the way mm -hmm. Pizzetta does, for example, uh, it's still minutes that you can, you can save from your top nine guys. Uh, going with 10 forwards, it, it becomes Every line very has to play 20 minutes a night. exhausting. Every line would have to play 20 minutes a night. Yeah, but the Canadians don't have that. They, they don't have enough good forwards that warranted to be played no, 20 agreed. minutes a night. They have guys that, Agre I mean, you cannot play, you cannot play Brendan Gallagher 20 minutes a night. No. You know, you, you have, you have good time management for each guy and you try to say, okay, well, within the way that their age is, their, 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 their health is, their production is and whatnot, their shortcomings, whatever, there's, For each of them, there's an ideal. We talked about the, the other day about the Goldilocks zone for each player. Well, if you ask out of them to play all of them to play 20 minutes a night, man, it's, it's bunkers. Who And you do that just because you, you, you want to save, you want to hold on to, to, to your, 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 your wealth of young defensemen and make sure you don't lose any? No, I think it's just a different way to get them all involved in the game. And I think that the notion of having four pairings, one for each opposing forward line, is intriguing. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, listen, I think there's ways to tweak it, but I think the actual, the actual idea is interesting. I don't, I'm not going to dismiss it the way you are. I think, I think defensemen, Why is it the defenseman can play 20 minutes? I, I understand it's less taxing in many ways, but in many ways it's not. Um, I agree with you that Brendan Gallagher in an ideal world wouldn't pay 20 minutes. And frankly, I think under this scenario, what would happen is, okay, with, let's just take the current, let's take the, the Canadiens lineup against the Rangers on Saturday as an example. Or actually even better, mm -hmm. let's take a fully healthy Canadiens lineup as an example. So you have the top line. Let's say they play... Let's say, always happens. Well, let's happens just use so it as often. an example. Crying out loud, man. You're so dismissive. You're so closed minded. I don't, this is such a good outside the box idea. It deserves exploration. I know. I know. I'm so just playing devil's advocate. Line, don't worry about line, it, man. Don't worry about it. 23 me. minutes. Okay. Second line Kirby yeah. Doc, Alex Newhook, and uh, Josh Anderson, let's say. 20 minutes. And then third line would be Sean Monaghan, Brendan Gallagher, and uh, and who? Dvorak? Sure, Dvorak. Um, or Evans. We put Evans on the wing, the way he was before. Um, 17 minutes. Or HP or, or HP. whoever. Yeah, 17 yeah. minutes. And then you have that 10th forward who gets to spell guys every now and then. Basically, every... Every shift, one guy would get a shift off because that 10th forward would take their spot. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so he would, so that 10th guy would basically play with all three lines and he would take turns giving guys a rest as the game goes on. Right. So that, that addresses your, your too so, many minutes concern in the sense that guys will get rests periodically over the course of the game. And it's not an, It's not an outrageous bump in ice time. I don't know. It's it's interesting. I think it's doable. Is is it's would it be more effective? I don't know. But I think it's doable. It's an interesting idea and it's an interesting concept and I find it I find it quite but but what really turned my crank about If that email were, was the 3D 2F late in the game. That's that's I thought I've I'm a firm proponent of that. That should be tried. Someone should try that. The other thing is The way I see it, that the, the way that I, I say it could work is uh, on the PK. If you could dress eight defensemen, we never see defensemen practicing their face-offs, right? If you have one of your eight defensemen, that's not too bad at face-offs. If you oh, start you're... having them practice it, then you could use three defensemen and one forward yeah, on the PK. Exactly. You could. It's it's really a matter because once the puck is on the ice, uh, and I think that there's a big issue having two guys that 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 can at least win you a face off in in case because you're already yeah you don't you're already yeah. down one guy so at least you want to start with the puck as much as possible so it reduces the uh, your chance of doing it if you ask <laughs> a defenseman to make a, to take a face off but once the puck is is, is on the ice. 
I don't think that you lose anything well, by actually, having I think it's, three defensemen out there. I think, in, well, I think it's diamond. even more effective in a diamond. It's, it's in a traditional box, it would be awkward. But in a diamond, it makes perfect sense. Right. You have the one forward up top. You have a two defensemen on either flank or a defenseman on either flank and the, one, and the defenseman down low. As it stands now, I think the – I think the weeks you, already, you always have a defenseman well, on the flank. Well, you always have a forward the on the uh, covering the other flank. That's the problem. I think that's the weak point. Yeah. On the PK is below that forward on the flank, and so if that's a defenseman mm-hmm. instead, um, you could play. You could have two units of one forward, three defensemen, and just make sure that center doesn't get kicked out of the circle. Like that's basically what you got to hope for, and and. If he does, then you're going to lose the draw. And that's all there is to it. But I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's a good outside the box way of thinking. I think, uh, I think there's someone should yeah. try it. We'll ask I'm, around. I've, 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 the 3D, the, the 3D2F Marty thing, I've, I've wanted to ask Marty about it for a while. I haven't thought of it. It hasn't come up, mm-hmm. but, um, I want to ask him about it and see if what he thinks. But yeah, it's, you know, I think everyone looks at uh, looks at kind of new ideas um, as being uh, as being sort of crazy. I don't think this one's that crazy. I think this yeah. this one has some merit to it. Um, okay, let's get it. We're gonna finish it up because it's, it's we're running pretty late, and we we always do this. We don't. In our in our pre-show planning, well, let's, let's try to let's try to do two more uh, two more maybe. Uh, Nicolas Côté on Twitter asked us uh, with the defensive and face-off contribution of Stephens, the use of Evans is no longer essential. Do you believe that he could bring a good return in a trade? That'll be a very short answer on this one because you're, I think your premise yes. is wrong. Uh, I think that Evans is more essential than before because the Canadians only have four mm-hmm. centermen right now. They cannot do without another sentiment. So it's the, and Stevens is doing fine as a stopgap fourth line center. And it's good that they have those people, but it's not because you have a player like Stevens that all of a sudden it makes somebody else expendable. Ultimately, when you have a full lineup that's healthy and you have Stevens in the American league, it's just good to know that when the, the need arises, you can call him up and he'll do the job. So that's worth a lot, but that doesn't make Evans expendable. The day that they resign Monahan and Monahan's healthy, that Doc's back, that Dvorak is healthy, and that you get all that chunk of the uh, of forwards of centermen, then maybe we could discuss if Evans is uh, could, could be you know could fetch you something on the trade market. But as it currently stands, until the end of the season. He's going to be very much needed, probably more than he's ever. This is also a little flawed. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's not, it's flawed because it's linking Stevens to Evans. If you separately ask, what is Jake Evans' value on the trade market? I think he does have value on the trade market because he's, he's a role player. He doesn't cost an outrageous amount of money. He's actually, he is slightly overpaid for what he does because I think his role is, you is taken by league minimum guys like Mitchell Stevens, but league minimum type of guys. So yeah, he's a bit of a luxury item. Uh, I don't know in this cap environment, how many teams would be willing to take on the money that Jake Evans makes for what he does. But to further your point, Marc Antoine, like Saturday night, you know, I was expecting Sean Monaghan to do a lot of the matchup stuff. Uh, it was Jake Evans, you know, Jake Evans is, was matched up. Jake Evans, Brendan Gallagher, Josh Anderson, they were the designated starting line, uh, which is Marty did in Winnipeg as well um, and had to play very tough matchups. Their most common line was the Zibanejad line, was Fox on defense with Lindgren. Second most was the Panarin line uh, with with Miller and Truba on the back end. So, you know, that's, they were doing a lot of heavy lifting in that Rangers game and they were facing some difficult matchups. And that's, that's J- Jake Evans provides that, you know, Dvorak also provided that. Yeah. Um, Jake Evans is cost less than Dvorak, but he costs more than Nick Benino, for instance, <laughs> who does that for New York, you know, and they were like, or any number of fourth line t- type guys. Uh, and let's be honest, Jake Evans is a fourth line type guy. 
So I don't think his trade value is very high. Yeah, the fact that – no, the, and I think that he's, he's slightly overpaid because when you're in that situation, I mean, he logs more ice time than your natural – your well, yeah, typical just... fourth-line guy because he can easily play 14, 15 minutes. But he doesn't have either on one end the like the the ver- the dominance and the faceoff circle, which is something that sometimes teams will, mm-hmm. will like to have and and might pay a premium for. Uh, I think of the Red Wings in the height of Luke Glennon's career, they gave him a four year deal uh, that was averaging one point eight million dollars a year. But that's because he was top class in the NHL and when it came to to faceoffs. Or at the other end that. Y- you get sneaky offensive contribution mm-hmm. from the guy. Evans is can create chances. He can help move the play, but he he doesn't have any mm. finishing touch, and so it doesn't translate into points. But at least he moves the the puck away from his own end when he plays with better players. So eventually, it'll definitely be a, a expandable, but not in no. the current climate. Not, not in this, in this economy. No, exactly, and I don't think I think. I think the most likely scenario for Jake Evans is he plays out his contract and uh, the Canadians move on from him at that point, unfortunately for him. But it's, it's, yeah. you know, I remember talking to Jake Evans shortly after he signed that contract and, uh, you know, 1.7 million a year for four years. So a total of, or for three years, sorry. So a total of $5.1 million. And he was, he was, he was hurt that night and it happened to, be sitting with me at the in the press box in St. Louis, and I was just like, "Have you wrapped your head around the fact that you're going to have like you have like five million dollars coming your way in the next three years?" He's like, "Honestly, no. Like it's crazy. Like it's just it's it, he could not process what had just happened to him, and and it was, you know, it was he it, he wasn't even happy. He was he was like flabbergasted. <laughs> this is the thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, one point seven a year." For what he does, like I don't think he's quite turned into what Mark Bergevin thought he would be when he signed him to this deal. That was Mark Bergevin, was it not? Yes, it was. And so yeah, 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 it was. Yeah, he sort he of plateaued. plateaued. That's yeah. the thing. If he had continued to get better, it would have made him a, a very interesting right. uh, bargain. But as it stands, he sort of became who yeah. he was, and, and that's, that's fine. That. I mean, it's nice. He's not grossly overpaid, but. In this economy, as you mentioned, or under this in this cap climate, uh, he makes too much for what he does. But the, the extra money is the fact that you can play him higher up the lineup, and he won't necessarily hurt you. Um, those league minimum type yeah. guys who fill that same role, like Mitchell Stevens, if you have Mitchell Stevens too high up your lineup, he is going to hurt you. There's no way he can play what he could do what Jake Evans is doing, what Jake Evans did on Saturday night, playing against. Mika Zibanejad all night and surviving. <laughs> I think is how you would. And he did that. He did that every year. In the past three years, Evans, when he was not one of the guys yeah. that were hurt himself, uh, when he was healthy, he was asked to do more than was originally expected because the team was so decimated. Yeah. You're perfectly right. Mitchell no. Stevens could not do that. Um, okay, let's do this last one. This one came over. Uh, This one came over Twitter, um, came from uh, Jay Golding. And I think a few people asked this, so it's it's just a technicality kind of thing, but it's um, why do teams wait to put players who are gone for the season due to injury on LTIR? Why not do it immediately? And so if you look on Cap Friendly right now, um, Kirby Doc is not on LTIR. Let me just make sure that, that that's still true. But Kirby Doc is not on LTIR. Christian Dvorak is not on LTIR, uh, both of whom are gone for the season. No, still, still the case. The only person on LTIR right now is Carey Price. Um, there's no real reason for it other than putting a player on LTIR requires a bunch of paperwork, and if it's not necessary, they just frankly they don't feel like they don't feel like doing the paperwork. <laughs> so until they run out of LTIR money with Carey Price, they're just not going to do it, and I can't blame them. Like who wants to do paperwork if it's not necessary? So. Um, but right now they have about 2.5 million out of the 10.5 million remaining, uh, from Carey Price being on LTIR. If, and when that runs out, they can retroactively put Kirby Doc on there. They can put Christian Dvorak on there. And so there's no, 
there's no reason to do it until it's needed. Um, but maybe that'll be a tell if the Canadians actually decide to like take on a bad contract or something like it's, if all of a sudden Kirby doc winds up on LTIR, then get your antenna up because something's, something's coming down yeah. the, the, something's coming down the pipe. Uh, but as it stands right now, they don't need the space. Um, so it just kind of be needless work for nothing. Um, but it is available to them if they require it. Chris Weidman too, for all intents and purposes. I mean, there, there was a question about Chris Weidman. He's been around the team over the last few days. Uh, I understand that television cameras are showing him in Ken Hughes's booth, but there's still no uh, no news on him. Uh, we haven't gotten any update on his status, but uh, he's also a candidate who could go on LTIR, and it's only seven hundred and sixty grand or so. But it's another guy that maybe could go there. Yeah, I think uh, if they they would put Kirby Doc on LTIR if there's a like a, a big salary guy that would come as a salary exactly. dump. So, uh, yeah, but uh, the fact that he thing. hasn't gone so on yet, if all of a sudden you go on cap friendly and you see, Oh, Kirby docs on LTIR, then, uh, yeah, then, you know, start scrolling, <laughs> check, if you check it, check, check the That's Twitter it. machine. Yeah. Cause it could be, it could be some news coming. Yeah. All right, let's. Uh, thanks for that, Arpin. So we'll wrap it up at uh, this point. Thanks again for uh, sending us your questions. I know that we didn't go through all of them. Uh, there's a lot, and we'll, we'll try to do our best. There are some that we're going to keep, maybe, and, and deal with at a later date. So because there are some that are sort of mm -hmm. evergreen, <laughs> so we, we can always uh, come back to those. So, um, but it's, just for future reference, if you want to send us your question, you can do so by. Uh, Uh, either on Twitter, you can send it to our uh, to the show's uh, Twitter handle, which is Basu and Godin, or on, uh, by email at Basu and Godin at gmail.com. Uh, we're going to be back on Friday for our next show. Um, that's it. I hope you have a good hope week. Hope you have a good week as well. Hope everyone out there has a good week, and we will talk to you on Friday. <laughs>